I'd like to welcome everyone to our uh, webinar today on tick-borne diseases. My name is Dr. Mary Ellen LaSala, and I am the chair of undergraduate studies, Stony Brook University School of Nursing. Next slide, please. So I'd like to just talk a little bit about the Healthy Libraries Program, who is sponsoring this webinar today. Stony Brook Medicine's Health Libraries Program, we also call ourselves HELP, is a partnership with the Public Libraries of Suffolk County, the Suffolk Cooperative Library System Outreach Services Department, and is supported in part by the American Heart Association of Long Island. The program is an interdisciplinary team of public health, nursing, and social work students whose aim is to provide evidence-based health information, screening, and case managers, management to a diverse community of patrons in the public library setting. Another aim is to refer patr patrons to promote access to appropriate health and social services programs locally that will address their health and social support needs. And another aim is for students to experience an interprofessional team and demonstrate the core competencies based on the Interprofessional Education Collaborative. Next slide. And I would like to introduce you to our content expert, Dr. Anna Marie Wel Wellens. Dr. Wellens is a clinical assistant professor at Stony Brook University's Advanced Graduate Nursing Education Program. She completed her Doctor of Nursing Practice degree in 2015 at Stony Brook University. Prior to joining the Stony Brook faculty, she worked as a nurse practitioner in Sag Harbor, New York. She frequently saw tick-borne disease during her clinical practice due to the high prevalence of ticks in, on the East End of Long Island. She is a member of the East End Tick Advisory Council, which focuses on tick-borne disease education, treatment and prevention for the community, and as a resource to local healthcare professionals. She is currently co-investigator uh, of an NIH-founded study on Lyme's disease in collaboration with Rutgers University. Dr. Wellens? Well, uh, thank you very much. You want me to talk about the, um, the regional tick? Yes, I, well, I do want to say that I'm still working in primary care uh, in Sag Harbor, New York. And I'm still uh, seeing, even with COVID, I'm still seeing tick-borne diseases. So, um, so they're kind of, kind of together this summer. Mm -hmm. um, but I am a part of the Regional Tick-Borne Disease Resource Center, which uh, is at Stony Brook Southampton Hospital. And our goal, our mission is to educate the public, um, promote collaboration, particularly, particularly community and uh, physician educational opportunities within the medical community and access um, to diagnosis and treatment of tick-borne diseases. I've been on the advisory panel now since about 2015. And one of the great things about this uh, resource center is we have a tick helpline. So um, anybody that has a question about um, anything to do with ticks or symptoms or tick-borne diseases, they can call 631-726-TIC. There is a nurse that mans that, um, that um, call center. And um, we have uh, calls from all over the world, Hawaii, Australia, Europe, every, everywhere. So it's very interesting. Uh, and we do have a link if anybody's interested, um, Stony Brook's um, um, Southampton, Stony Brook Medicine for additional um, information related to tick-borne diseases. So today our program objectives include identify the definition of a vector, identify em environmental and habitat disruptions that increase tick populations, identify common signs and symptoms of Lyme disease, and identify common treatments for tick-borne diseases. Lastly, identify things you can do to reduce your risk of getting a tick bite. Thank you for attending this webinar. We're so glad that you're joining us. We would like to know how well we are doing in meeting our learning objectives. Please complete the poll on the screen. It's anonymous. Name or identifiers will not be recorded or known to us with your responses. 
And Gabrielle, will you give further direction? Um, so I'm trying to launch the poll now. Okay. Let's see. Okay. So the poll should be on your screen and um, the answers are completely anonymous. If you could just answer the questions to the best of your ability. Can everyone see the poll? Mm -hmm. Yes. All right, so um, the poll is ended and we're gonna share the results at the end of the webinar and discuss the questions. Thank you. Okay, so I'm going to begin with um, just general information about ticks and the ticks that I'm going to be presenting today are common in, common in our area, um, actually in the Northeast, they're actually all around the country and, and worldwide, but these are hard body ticks, it makes them a little bit different than from other insects. Uh, but the life cycle is the same for all the different types of hard body ticks and we're going to talk about deer ticks, the lone star tick and the dog tick. Um, so what happens is um, ticks live for about two years as long as they get three blood meals. Um, they hatch, um, they're, they hatch in the spring, most, they can hatch all year round, but mostly in the spring. The eggs are generally not considered to be infective. They molt into what's called larva, and I call those the baby ticks. Um, they're about the size of a piece of celery salt, so really, really tiny, and they like to feed on um, rodents, and particularly the white-footed mouse. Um, the mouse is what harbors the spirochete that causes disease and other pathogens that cause tick-borne diseases. So once they feed, they sort of lay low for a while. They get in, If they're infected, uh, they molt into what's called a nymph, and I call them the teenage ticks. Um, and they need to feed again, because remember they need a blood meal to progress to the next stage, a total of three blood meals. And they will again feed on, uh, on rodents, such as um, mice or the white-footed mouse, that's common in our area. Or they may feed on another mammal, such as man or a dog or a cat or a horse. Um, and when they, um, again, when, while they're feeding, if they're infected, they will transmit the um, disease. Finally, they will then lay low at the end of their two-year cycle, and uh, they will 
molt into an adult, adult male and female, and the females are what lay the eggs. And for their last blood meal, they prefer deer. They're very large mammals, and that is their preferred uh, feed feeding. That's who, the mammal that they prefer to feed on. And once they get that big hefty blood meal um, is when the females will fall off the deer and then lay the eggs and the cycle begins again. The next slide. And again, this is the uh, black-legged ticks. These are um, Azotes scapularis. They're called black-legged or deer ticks. And again, I spoke about the different uh, stages. Again, for the two-year life cycle, you have the larvae that are first hatched from the eggs who molt into the nymphs, and then the adult male and female. So again, a three, about a two-year cycle. Like I said, the larvae are really tiny, very hard to see, the size of a piece of celery salt. Uh, the nymph is about the size of a poppy seed, and the adult male and female are about the size of a sesame seed. So again, very small, hard to, hard to, hard to see. Next slide. The Lone Star ticks, now they're new, relatively new to the north. Um, they migrated from the south, and again, they are the hard body ticks, the same as life cycle as the uh, Azotis scapularis or the deer tick that I talked about. They have the larva, the nymph, the adult male and female. The females are noted to, um, with their white dot on their, on their body. Um, and again, um, they are, the thing that makes them different is they're very aggressive. Uh, the larva are aggressive, the nymphs and the adult female. The adult males kind of like, They'll, they're not as aggressive, um, particularly as, as aggressive as the adult female. And then the next slide is the dog tick. And they've been around forever. Um, and uh, they tend not to um, bite humans, although they will if there's no other blood meal available. Um, they feed on what's called the prairie voles. <laughs> they prefer those little, um, those, um, animals. And again, they have the same uh, life, you know, life cycle. And the next slide shows all three, the black legged, the lone star, and the, and the dog tick. The dog tick's a little larger, the adults are, so they're more easily seen. And again, you will find them on your dogs, but you will find if you have a pet dog or um, any sort of livestock, you will find all three of these, um, you know, on animals, if they're in an exposed area. And again, this is just another depiction of the life cycle. Um, this is the Azotis scapularis, but remember that all the hard body ticks um, follow the same life cycle. So spring, um, you know, the eggs um, will hatch and uh, they will um, feed uh, on a mouse and then they will kind of hang out for a while over the winter and then they will molt into the nymph, which is again in the spring and they need to feed again. So if they get, a, they get the mouse or they may get us or some other animal, uh, then they molt again. If they're infected, they will then the next time they feed, they will, um, they will inoculate their, um, their the, whatever animal, or whatever host they're feeding on. And then at the end of their final feed, they, uh, the, egg, the adults will die and the eggs are hatched. Next slide. This is engorgement of an adult um, deer tick or a black legged tick. And you can see with feeding how large it gets. And if, if, we, um, if a human gets bit, um, bit or a, by one of these, it's usually well seen. Um, but the smaller the nymphs are, when they engorge, they don't look much bigger than, than they did uh, before they were feeding. Uh, this is an adult female tick. This is a deer, a deer tick or a black legged tick. They can, the females will hatch from several hundred to several thousand eggs. Remember, each one of these eggs, and if you're not itchy now, you will be soon. <laughs> uh, they will, um, and again, they, you can see on the lower part, you can see the translucent larva, then the nymph, and then the adult. And again, the deer tick and the dog tick go through the same process. Next slide. And you can see Lyme disease is the most predominant um, disease transmitted by ticks. 
Uh, so for every 10 cases of Lyme disease, you have an, one of the other diseases, such as babesiosis or anaplasmosis, which I'll talk about later. But you can see from 2001 to 2015, this is a CDC depiction. You can see the blue is where the Lyme disease, um, uh, where the, you know, uh, caused by the uh, black leg of tick. Um, and you can see that they are, the penetrance of this tick is just, just growing and every year it gets worse. Next slide. The black legged tick on the left, you can see this where regionally they are. The Zodes scapularis are from Texas all the way south, all the way up to the Northeast and the Midwest. Now don't think that the wet, Western United States is out of, uh, you know, is safe. They have the Zodes pacificus <laughs> that causes Lyme disease. So they're, they're still affected. Um, and then on the right, the Lone Star Tick, which is the Amliota americanum, uh, the Latin name for them, they were originally in the south and they started migrating up with probably within the last 10 years. And you see they're not quite to the north of Maine, but they are really migrating up. And this has been a huge problem um, for, you know, anybody that encounters these tick bites. And the uh, tick bites are, um, are not always noticed because they could be painless and the um, ticks are very tiny. Like I have the, the sesame, the poppy seed bagel, just to show you those are the size, size of the nymphs. Um, and they also tend to bite behind the knees and the axe, you know, in the armpit or in the groin. So a lot of times if they may be missed and they could feed and then fall off and without the individual knowing that they've been bitten. And then environmental factors are very important and habitat is very important because in the, specifically in the Northeast where we live, the, um, it's believed that the Lone Star ticks have migrated up from the South with bird migrations, but there's a, it's a very complicated process when we look at um, environment and habitats because we do have, even though it's very controversial, there are climate changes that are occurring. Um, and uh, this is also, you know, played into this. And then of course, the um, factors in terms of the abundance of this white-footed um, mouse, which is a rodent, and also chipmunks who are very, very cute, uh, but they also harbor pathogens. <laughs> they also can have pathogens um, that, and other diseases that can, um, that the ticks will feed on and then they will get, can potentially get transmitted to humans or other our mammals. In the next slide. And then the, um, so we have an overabundance of, uh, of rodents and then uh, we have predators are reduced. So if you can recall, um, because, you know, particularly if we look at Long Island, um, you know, just basically the um, building um, and the pot, you know, the building of homes and the urban kind of like the semi-urban sprawl that has occurred, you know, things like uh, fox and, uh, you know, mountain lions, which are not endemic to, um, obviously, uh, Long Island, but upstate New York, and again, birds of prey, um, basically have been either captured or hunted out, so they're, they're not around. Now, a predator is not going to eat every single mouse, because remember, the rodents carry the disease, but the presence of a, of a predator in an area keeps the mice and the rodents at bay. It kind of it kind of keeps them in their nest. They don't they don't tend to wander as much, even though let's say we do have fox you know, on Long Island, they are coming back, which is a good thing. Um, but a fox in, in a several mile area will the mice know that that fox is there. Um, so they don't tend to wander as much. They kind of stay put. Um, so that's a huge issue as well not having the predators. And the next slide, and now we have a deer. And you can see this is a, 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 a juvenile deer, um, female. And you can see on the ears, you see all those like swollen grape-like structures. Those are feeding adult ticks, females mostly. Um, and, they, and there can be thousands of them on the uh, deer. We have more deer, um, although if the ticks, if the deer wasn't here, they would find another animal um, or a mammal to feed on, but the deer are plentiful. And 
one of the reasons that deer are plentiful is we used to hunt 100 years ago, we hunted deer. And also, we were more agricultural um, as well. And that shifted to the Midwest in terms of farming. And then the hardwood forests um, populated the Northeast. And then we had all this building uh, where we tore down the forests. And then their habitat is now disrupted. And also, the farms um, now have these have like nine foot fences, which were previously not, they weren't allowed to have that height and to keep the deer out because obviously they were eating the crops, which is a problem. So they're constantly getting pushed out of their small wooded, like we call them chaparrales. Um, and now they're in our, they're, where are they? They're in our front lawns, lawns in our backyard and they're right next to us. And we see them walking down Main Street everywhere. Uh, and a problem, you know, there's so many of them, they're being displaced, they are obviously causing issues with traffic, um, you know, uh, accidents and things like that. So, and they're a nuisance for anybody that wants to have any sort of garden as well. The deer are very good at um, reproducing and eating. They're, those are the two good things the deer are good for, <laughs> very good for. They're cute, um, but there are way, way too many of them. Next slide. And just one thing, uh, this is the disruption of the habitat. So you see you have all these like little hardwood chaparrales that are being torn down to put in a home that maybe somebody vac will spend a couple of weekends in the summer uh, or, you know, just like huge swaths of uh, properties just being torn down in terms of uh, the habitats. And that, that disrupts the deer and other, um, and other animals as well, just not the deer. And um, when I think of the deer, I think of the deer as, they're the transporter of ticks. I think of them as a giant like cruise ship um, carrying ticks. So whenever you see a, t uh, a deer in your, in your driveway or on your lawn, they're sleeping on, at night, the ticks are falling off and the females are laying eggs. And then you have those thousands of eggs that are being hatched on your front lawn backyard and all around, all around us. Next slide. So just to get back to a little bit of science, a vector is an organism, um, typically a biting insect or what here is tick, that will transmit a disease from one parasite or a parasite from one animal to another. Um, so they, they, they become infected when they feed on the, an infected mouse or another rodent, and then they will transmit that disease when they're feeding on the next um, animal. And if it's us, we're human, and we can become infected. And again, dogs and horses are also infected. And the reservoir is um, an animal such as a rodent where the infectious agent normally lives and multiplies. They don't seem to be affected by it. They have um, an immune system. And this is something that really needs to be studied more, how they keep the, the infection at bay without getting sick. But the reservoir typically harbors the infection without any injury to itself. Next slide. And we're the host, and also the deer are the host as well. Um, now, they, we don't know how, you know, obviously we can't interview the deer to find out if they have a headache or a fever, uh, but they seem to do okay. They, they are reservoir, though. We talked about a host as an animal or uh, that in which a parasite bacteria virus lives. They, well, they are the reservoir for a disease called auriculosis, which I will talk about later. But we are, as humans, are inadvertent hosts. The, particularly the adult ticks prefer not to feed on us. They prefer the deer. It's their pref preferential um, host because they can get a nice big fat blood meal. And the better their blood meal, the more eggs the female will lay. Next slide. And here we have um, an adult tick on the right, and you can see them perched on a blade of grass. Um, this is this is what's called questing. You can see their back legs, you know, they're an arthropod and they're, they're holding on to their, to the, um, the blade of grass with their back legs and their front um, kind of arms are stretched out. They are um, what's called questing. And what happens is they can sense carbon dioxide, heat and vibration. So if we're walking by and they need a blood meal, they'll attach to us or a horse or um, a deer. Um, and that's called questing. So they will climb up on the blade of grass, wait for somebody to come by or something, 
um, and they need humidity to survive. They will, they do not live in the hot sand at the beach. You will not get bit by a tick. You'll get bit by something else at the beach, but not by a tick. But they are in the dunes or any place that's shaded and where there's moisture. Um, they need the moisture to survive. On the left, you can see the bicycle. And um, I use this picture just to depict this is where the ticks are. Um, if the deer are or have gone through this area, they lay the, the eggs down and then the ticks will now are now in that area and they will, um, you know, molt from, you know, their, the, um, the larva to the nymph to the adult. And, you know, the poor person who's going to retrieve that bicycle is, um, you know, <laughs> needs to be in a hazmat suit in order not to get um, to be covered by ticks. Next slide. So the common, again, the most common, like I said earlier, the most common uh, tick-borne disease is, um, well, is Lyme disease. Like, so for every 10 cases of Lyme disease, you have one of the other that is listed down, you know, that's transmitted from the Lone Star tick and the dog tick. So the black-legged uh, deer tick uh, or the Zodes scapularis transmits a Lyme disease, which is, um, the organism is a spirochete, and it is related to syphilis. It is a cousin to syphilis. So a lot of the uh, signs and symptoms of it, you can are, you know, there's an overlap with what was, um, you know, um, signs and symptoms of syphilis. There's a, there's a um, relationship there in terms of the symptoms. They're, they also transmit babesiosis, which is a very serious uh, disease, and anaplasmosis. The lone star ticks, uh, transmit auriculosis. Now, again, the reservoir for this is the deer. They transmit uh, something called STARI, which is Southern Tick Associated Rash Illness. Uh, they believe it's a Borrelia. The Lyme disease uh, organism, the spirochete, is Borrelia burgdorferi, um, but the STARI is a Borrelia. They believe it's a Borrelia. They came out with it being Borrelia and they retracted it. So they're really not exactly sure what causes it, but it is treated with the same medicine as treated with Lyme disease. The other thing that the Lone Star ticks can do um, is called the alpha-gal meat allergy and it's becoming more common. People are talking about it more and those are from Lone Star tick bites, usually repeated Lone Star tick bites. They also transmit a rickettsial disease, which is very similar to Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever. Uh, it's not as, as, a, as a, a severe infection that's caused by the rickettsia, rickettsii, which causes Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever, but um, it can make individuals very ill. And tularemia is another thing that um, it's not common, but it can be transmitted by Lone Star Tick. The dog tick will transmit the Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever and also tularemia. Now the Rocky Mountain spotted fever that the dog tick transmits will cause someone to be very, very ill. They will require to be hospitalized. There's not that many cases. Um, there's about maybe 2,000 a year in the United States. Um, again, they don't have a preference for, um, in, you know, uh, um, basically feeding on humans. However, children can get affected and they most often wind up in the, in the hospital. They're very, very ill and they need, treated, they need to be treated very quickly um, in what otherwise they have very serious consequences. The next slide. So when you look at, um, any, you know, if we look at just in our own like local area in the Northwest, you know, we're on Long Island, we're, we have like uh, oceanic uh, with, you know, um, exposure to the water and, uh, you know, um, and again, our own environment, which, um, you know, we're obviously a cause of that disruption. So we're in what's considered an endemic area. So we're exposed by ticks, even if we're inside our house, if we have to walk out to our driveway and there's like, any sort of grass or any sort of vegetation, we're exposed to potentially ticks. So, and again, um, rash is a very good thing to note in terms of history because that's particularly for Lyme disease, although it can happen with starry, which is transmitted by the Lone Star tick. Um, so rash is very important. However, rash a lot of times um, is not reported or it's missed or the person who develops uh, particularly Lyme disease may not report a rash or have a rash at all. So you look at symptoms and flu-like symptoms in the summer, although this summer is a little different because 
because that could be COVID, <laughs> COVID-19. So, but flu-like symptoms generally in the summer, um, you know, headache, muscle aches, fever, chills, um, uh, fatigue, um, their flu-like symptoms without the nasal or the cough um, are not usual in the summer. They're usual in the winter. The other thing is a facial palsy or a droop on one side of the face. Um, that is also, again, um, those are part of the cranial nerve system and a Lyme disease particularly can cause that. And that's significant. And that's a clue that, um, that, that if you, somebody has like that facial palsy that they could have Lyme disease. Uh, labs and diagnostics are very tricky. We do have a tick panel that we can, we can order um, on patients. We can test all the diseases except Lyme disease does not show up in the blood um, early on. Um, so that's a challenge, which I'll talk about later. But um, we can test directly for babesiosis, anaplasmosis, auriculosis, Rickettsial, um, all of those because they, they they stay in the blood. They're an infection that you know starts out and stays in the blood. Not unlike Lyme that does not stay in the blood. We can also do a parasite smear for babesiosis, and we can actually see uh, the red blood cells. Um, with um, you know, we can see that the parasite is in them, so that can be very helpful. And then of course treatment, early treatment is very important. Identifying. Um, the signs and symptoms and getting treatment early. And then again, very important to reduce further ex future exposure to really um, to mitigate uh, things that can be done that may be inconvenient, but are very important, particularly if you live in an endemic area like Long Island. So Lyme disease, um, there's estimated 300 cases a year. This is a, a low count because these are, re these are confirmed by blood tests and again, Basically, uh, Lyme disease is usually um, diagnosed by, um, you know, by symptoms and the presence of a rash um, because uh, there is really no early um, blood test. Um, there, you, it can't be cultured out. If it can be, it's a very short window where it stays, where the spirochete stays in the blood. And it's estimated that 40 to 60 percent of adult ticks, the black-legged tick, are infected, and about 20% of the nymphs are infected. So when those nymphs or the larvae are feeding on the mouse, not every single mouse is infected, not every single chipmunk or other rodents, are, or birds can also carry these diseases. They're not all infected, but if they are, uh, th this is testing that's done by the Department of Health. They drag for ticks you know, periodically, and they test um, the infection rates. So the nymphs are active right now, spring, spring and summer, but the adults continue to be active all year, particularly if temperatures are above freezing. They will start coming out of, um, come, they, they don't die in a really hard freeze, and they need um, humid conditions. So they need, otherwise they will dry up and die. The next slide. So the chances of getting Lyme disease, which is again, the most common tick-borne um, disease, is um, if they're feeding for greater than 24 hours. And the tick mouth part is anchored, into, it cements itself into the skin, so you, it really gets in there. The tick saliva can be an irritant, irritant, or some people just don't feel it, but they also secrete like an anesthetic agent as well. So what happens is when they're feeding, it's like a backwash system. The spirochete is, or for Lyme disease, uh, or Borrelia burgdorferi is in the gut and it washes back into the mouth as it's feeding. So it's like this like regurgitation of, the, of their stomach parts going into their mouth and then inoculating an animal or a person. We're only seeing, um, the CDC says uh, the bullseye rash is present like 70 to 80%. We're only seeing less than half of pa um, patients that have Lyme disease with the rash. Sometimes they don't realize they have a rash uh, they, or, or it's an atypical rash that they discount, but we're not seeing bullseye rashes consistently, and it may be because people are getting infected over again. So the subsequent infections, maybe they're not mounting a rash. But flu-like symptoms, joint muscle aches, fever, chills, headache, neck pain, fatigue, mental cloudiness, what they call typically a brain fog, and this facial palsy where they have a droop on one side of their face or any sort of visual changes should uh, point to a tick-borne disease. The next slide. So. Um, again, there is a diagnostic test, but it's a two-tier antibody test, and or they, they call the ELISA Western blot. 
And that is only if um, that will come positive if someone missed um, where they, they didn't know they had Lyme or they disregarded the symptoms because the symptoms are elusive. They, you know, you're not feeling well, you're sleepy, you're fatigued. It could be for a hundred different reasons um, because you don't always have the full blown symptoms that are listed under Lyme disease. So if it was missed in a month, you will see positive antibodies. If it's treated early, which is what we want, you will not see any antibodies mount. Um, so if the person got antibiotics early, a month later, they're not going to have any antibodies, which is what we want. So based on symptoms or what they, we call empiric treatment, we will prescribe doxycycline for 14 to 28 days based on history, based on rash, based on a known tick bite, although we don't go no, for that they because did you get bit by a tick? Well, I don't know. Well, if you're here living on Long Island, you are in endemic areas, so you probably, you, your chances are you very high that you could have gotten bit by a tick. So the doxy is good. It's not given for children under eight years old. It is, however, very important for children for Rocky Mountain spotted fever. Only doxy will work, but it's a, it's a short course. So it's safe for children. But for long courses, it's not recommended because they're tooth staining. The other thing that's really important with doxycycline or any of the antibiotics, because amoxicillin can be given, um, and there's also um, cefuroxamine is another, it's a cephalosporin antibiotic, um, can be given if someone's allergic to doxycycline um, and um, as well. But it's very, very important that, that individuals that are put on antibiotics finish the antibiotics. What I see in practice, which is, and other providers do as well, is that somebody comes in, they have some symptoms, they may have mount a rash, they're put on doxycycline for 14 days, we'll do a telephone call, you know, I only had the rash, I'm feeling better, I only took it for three or four days, I'm feeling better, I don't need it. No, um, those are the individuals that wind, will wind up having possibly long-term sequelae or complications of Lyme disease if they do not finish the course. So it's so important. And, and you know what, we can extrapolate information from other, um, other, other conditions that we give antibiotics for, and we know from, you know, um, that patients most about 50% of patients do not finish their course or do not take their medicines as they're prescribed. So it's very, very important. This is a real drive home message that um, individuals have to take their medicine um, complete. And if they have problems that they, they need to uh, call their provider. This is the two tier test I was talking about. So the initial test for Lyme disease, if it's positive or equivocal, um, then it goes to the Western blot. And the Western blot looks at bands. I look at IgM and IgG. Um, which are antibodies, they're proteins, they're, we look for the signature proteins for Lyme disease. But again, if someone's treated early, this would be negative. The next slide. Um, this is a typical EM rash um, or a bullseye rash. You can see uh, EM is erythemia migrans, but you can see here, this is very, uh, you know, very classic, but remember not all rashes appear this way, but you can see the red and then the clearing and then the, and then a, another expanding rash around the, clear, the, center, the area of clearing. The next, um, and then again, this is a very like my, very like light rash that can hardly see it. You have to really look at, at the light. You need really good lighting for this. And then the next slide, uh, again, this, this was actually, this photograph is um, from a, a, a student that I had whose daughter got bit by a tick and was misdiagnosed as an, as an infected mosquito bite. And she had Lyme disease. Um, next slide. And then, so Lyme, you have early infection, you could get a rat, you could have signs and symptoms three to 30 days after exposure. So real long incubation period. Uh, rash, flu-like symptoms. If it's not treated right away or recognized, it can go on to cause joint pain, arthritis, you know, headache, fatigue, and they can be neurological and cardiac involvement. And then late stage three is persistent months to years. They have really um, chronic, chronic condition, chronic symptoms. The Lyme, um, the Lyme organism or the spirochete stays in the blood for a very short period of time. It likes to go into collagen rich tissue, which is a spinal, uh, the neuro neurological system, the spinal column and the heart. They love um, the spirochete gloves and the joints as well and skin. That's where you get the rash. Next slide. And this is a Lyme, um, a Lyme uh, knee and you can see the swelling. So this person um, missed the early onset of Lyme disease, and now they have a swollen knee. 
and they will require treatment. Next slide. And then there's something called like, um, there's a certain subgroup of patients that they get treated, they get treated for Lyme early in the course. Hopefully they completed all their antibiotics, although that hasn't been studied. Um, but there's a, there is a, a theory that um, somehow or another, uh, you know, everyone's immune system is a little bit different. We have genetic variability. Um, some have more robust immunity, some have less immunity for a lot of different reasons. But uh, they believe that the dead organism, the dead spirochetes um, that are being cleared up by, by our own like white blood cells um, uh, may somehow or another trigger an, order, trigger an autoimmune response. Um, and then you get these like arthritic um, symptoms and other chronic neurological symptoms. And uh, neuro Lyme, or if it infects the neurologic sy system, those patients require uh, spinal tap to analyze the spinal fluid, and if positive, they need IV antibiotics for a month, and also cardiac involvement, because it does like to go to the heart. Again, very rich collagen in the heart muscle, and that can cause complications, causing heart block and arrhythmias, so those patients can be very ill from this. The next slide. Uh, six, so these patients, there may be, you know, it's like six months after being treated, they have these medically unexplained symptoms, they have cognitive difficulty, so um, they usually wind up going from one provider to another. And unfortunately, there's a lot of sh um, basically um, people that put out a shingle and they put you on a lighted table or they give you uh, shark oil um, or other treatments that are not, um, not evidence-based, not, not, not scientific, um, because these patients are desperate for help. The next slide. Now, babesiosis is also increasing, and you can see the red blood cells on the left. Those are called Maltese crosses in the red blood cells, signature for babesiosis, which is a parasite similar to malaria. Usually, if somebody has babesiosis, now, interestingly, children do generally do not get babesiosis unless they're immunocompromised. They somehow or another clear really, really well, and the, um, their livers work much better than adults. And it, and if an adult is drinking alcohol, quite a bit of it, they will have more problems with babesiosis. So alcohol intake does affect um, the ability of the body to fight babesiosis. But severe symptoms, these are more than, um, more than a Lyme presentation. Uh, severe headaches, severe fever, um, and then you, will, you can tell right away if there's babesiosis. And a lot of times just regular blood counts you know, have, will have abnormalities. And it's treated with something different. One of the things that's really important is all the tick-borne diseases pretty much are treated with um, doxycycline. This is not, and this is why it's so important um, because you can have two infections at once. You can have Lyme and babesiosis, um, or you could have what you think is Lyme, but it is babesiosis, so it's really important to rule out babesiosis. But the treatment is a combination of azithromycin and atovaquone, which is the other word is mepron. And unfortunately, mepron or atovaquone is very expensive, which is a problem for, uh, for our uh, you know, um, field workers, um, landscapers, if they don't have insurance. Uh, next slide. Uh, I put auriculosis and anaplasmosis together because their symptoms are similar. Um, they're from two different uh, tick species, you know, tick, um, one is the auriculosis is the lone star tick and anaplasmosis is the deer tick. They are, they, they stay in the blood. So again, you can culture it, which is really good. Anaplasmosis, uh, infects the monocytes and auriculosis affects the granulocytes. So they're in the blood. And again, so again, very, again, overlapping symptoms, very hard to figure out what do we have here, but fever, chills, fatigue, headaches, severe muscle aches. Usually these patients are sicker. And again, you can have Lyme um, and anaplasmosis together, or auriculosis and Lyme together. So those patients tend to be really sick if they have a co-infection. Co and again, um, a lot of times you'll see, like again, abnormalities in the blood counts, um, which can be telling as well. It's treated with doxycycline. And again, if somebody has severe symptoms and they have a rash, you will suspect that they have Two different, um, two different infections. But again, we just want to make sure that it, the other infection is not babesiosis because that's they may need doxy and the treatment for babesiosis, which is more medicine, different medicine. Next slide. 
Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever, I'll, I know I talked about that. Um, and again, very, very, um, if it has to be treated right away, um, and it's from the dog tick, but again, um, it's noted for its rash on the, and the hands, palms, and feet. Um, and again, it's tr uh, early treatment with doxycycline. And these patients usually are in the ICU um, because they're, they're so ill. Uh, next. Just, I just want to mention other uh, tick-borne diseases. We have a uh, Borrelia miyamotoi, which is very similar to Lyme disease. It's treated with antibiotics, which is very good. We're, um, the Department of Health also monitors for this in ticks. And the STARI, Southern Tick Associated Rash Illness, is similar to Lyme, treated with doxy. Um, Powassan encephalitis is a virus. Again, this is rare. There's been no cases in New, in New York State. Uh, but there have been cases in, I believe, Maine and uh, New Jersey and the Midwest. And again, very, this is <laughs> 50 per, um, a very high death rate, 10 to 15 percent of infected um, individuals. So this is not something, these are patients that wind up being in the ICU for supportive care. Uh, next um, slide. And then I want to talk about the, al the alpha-gal meat allergy, because this is increasing in, in its incidence. This is caused by the, uh, by the saliva of the lone star ticks. It could be the baby ticks, which I talked about as the larva. And basically what they do is they inoculate animals, um, or us, really us, with, um, with a carbohydrate, and it's called alpha-gal. It's something that we don't have in our, in, um, in a part of our, our blood or immune system. We just don't carry alpha-gal as carbohydrate. It's in um, it's present in non-primate animal mammals. So humans and chimpanzees and old bird monkeys don't have alpha gal. So if we get the inoculated with these lone, lone star tick, either the larval bites, which in the, that are, that happen in the late summer, remember these lone star ticks are very aggressive. They're, uh, they are ferocious feeders. So normally um, individuals will say, I got chigger bites at the end of the summer. No, there's no chiggers on Long Island, but they, what they did get bit was these larval, these long star tick larval bites. And what it does is this carbohydrate will cause antibodies so that if you then eat meat, mammalian meat, uh, you will get a reaction. This, um, you get an allergic reaction. It's delayed reaction. We call it midnight anaphylaxis. So you have a cheeseburger at six o'clock. At night and 11 o'clock, you wake up with hives and you need to go into the emergency room. So um, it's really, and again, it's any hoofed animal, uh, you know, uh, pork um, and cows, you know, anything with the hoof, not chicken and not fish. And next slide. So again, you can have a, a array of, of, of allergic reactions. You need uh, a medical attention. You can get tested for alpha-gal. You need to be referred to an allergist. You need to avoid mammalian meat and gelatin or anything that's made with meat. And it does tend to go away if you're not re-exposed to the lone tart. Star. I have the larva here, but lone star tick bites in general. And the, these patients need an EpiPen because they could have... Uh, swelling of the tongue and the mouth, which is a medical emergency. So they do need an EpiPen to have with them at all times. And it will also be um, in the care of an allergist. And this, these, are, these are larval bites. And keep in mind that these larvae are still inside the person. They're feeding. They feed for a couple of days, just like other ticks do. So these are hundreds of them. So these are not sugar bites if you're on Long Island. These are Lone Star larval bites. So you want to stay out of the, um, the, you don't want to go barefoot in the grass at the end of the summer or any time, any time, but particularly at that time of the year, at the end of the summer. The next slide. So very important with, uh, with ticks is to, if you see them, remove them immediately. We recommend um, fine, um, fine tip tweezers, try to grasp it by the head. You don't want to try to avoid it from the midsection because you could push the, or, um, the pathogens back into, into uh, this through the skin. Um, you want to pull them straight up and out. Um, that's the best way. Um, there's a lot of old wives tales, no burning, no gasoline, uh, no, bur no, no um, lighter and gasoline. <laughs> that would not be good. Um, and no other weird um, kind of treatments because that, like even acetone and whatever, because that can cause an infection, a secondary infection. Next slide. 
So there is a, um, there was a study that was done. Um, it's not a new study um, from the New England Journal of Medicine. And it does, um, it did look at a two tablet doxycycline treatment for anybody that had a tick bite for more than 36 hours, or if the tick was noted to be engorged, that they would get a doxycycline prophylactic dose. Um, and still, when we do this for patients, we always tell them to look for, a sign, you know, for signs and symptoms of any sort of tick-borne disease. Also, doxycycline needs to be given um, with food, non-dairy, and, and usually I recommend a probiotic if they're doing a full course, particularly, and stay out of the sun because they'll get sunburn. So any, do any dosing of doxycycline, you have to watch the sun, but it, will, it can upset the stomach, particularly if they, it's taken on empty stomach. So usually I tell them to take it with bread or a cracker, not with milk. Next slide. So protecting yourself, okay, you want to cover up, you want to have light, clo light colored clothes, and, and you want to be really fashionable by pushing, by pulling your socks over your pant legs. Um, but this makes ticks easier to see. Now remember, ticks do not fly through the air. <laughs> they, again, you have to brush up against um, vegetation or grass that when those ticks are questing. Um, looking for a meal. And so you want to walk in the middle of trails, you want to wear a hat, long sleeve shirt, light colored clothing. And this is if you're out in, in, in you know, in high, in high concentrated tick areas. Um, you can spray uh, repellent on clothes, particularly the shoes are very good. There's something called permethrin um, that you can get in the hardware store. And you spray, you can spray your shoes once a month out in the driveway. You can also spray your clothing out, you know, outside. You don't want to be doing it indoors because it is a pesticide. It does dry. It does not absorb onto the skin, but it will kill ticks that will attach to your clothing or your shoes. Uh, no bare, no bare feet. Um, you know, so these are things that will, are very helpful, particularly for people that are outside a lot. And again, children are high risk exposure. Uh, and, and retired individuals because they tend to be out in the garden. So they tend to have the most exposure. Next slide. And this is a four poster program. This has been shown to be, remember I talked about the deer are the carriers of the ticks. So um, this has been successful in the areas that they used it. They have these plant, these corn feeders. So when the deer want their corn, um, they will put their heads through rollers that are coated with permethrin. The permethrin that they get on their head and neck will kill all the adult ticks that are feeding on them. So if you kill the adult ticks, you will then not have the larva. And if you don't have a larva, you will not have, again, you will reduce the tick populations. In the areas, particularly Shelter Island, that they use this, they found to be very effective. However, it is expensive um, to maintain, but it is definitely something that has worked. Next slide. This repellent, I talked about the permethrin, um, put this on your clothing. Um, the skin repellent, you don't wanna put the permethrin on there, you just wanna use something with D. Um, that's the most effective, although the uh, lemon eucalyptus oil can be very effective as well. Next slide. Uh, and again, now the repellents give you the, the time for reapplying, like four to six hours. Um, so we, you know, read definitely read um, the instructions for re reapplying on your skin. And again, very important uh, repellent cover up permethrin, um, which is you put in your shoes and your clothing. And a lot of the camping uh, supplies and clothing now come with permethrin embedded into tents and knapsacks. So that that's that's happening more and more. The best thing to do is if you're outside at the end of the day, when you're done with your activities, get into the house, go immediately into the shower. While you're in the shower, put your clothing in the dryer before you wash them. Remember, the uh, ticks can survive a washing machine cycle, but they will not survive 20 minutes of high heat on a dryer. They will die, they desiccate, they just will shrivel up and die. And while you're in the shower, whatever is crawling on you will get washed off and then you can do your daily tick check. The things that are helpful for people that are outside is double-sided tape. If you have boots, you can put that at the end of your pants and, um, and where your boots meet because um, the, the tape traps the ticks. They won't go anywhere. Lint rollers when you come in because that'll pick up the ticks and they won't then go onto your skin. And again, no flip-flops. And then in terms of uh, pets, you know, oral medication, frontline, remember they can still carry them into the house, keep them off um, furniture and bed, they can get sick as well, uh, particularly with Lyme disease. So you need to be careful with your pets. And next slide. 
Uh, and again, just be really, be mindful around your house. Uh, high, tall grasses close to the house is not so great. You wanna keep grass that's mowed three inches or less. Uh, the ticks don't like the sunshine, so short grass, um, play areas in the sunshine, remove leaf litter, debris, create borders that sort of like a protective border from the wooded areas. The ticks don't necessarily like to cross over, over um, you know, uh, pebbles and, and, and cedar chips. And the next slide. And things like pachysandra and ivy, ticks love um, rock walls, wood piles, bird feeders, they're beautiful, but they attract mice and chipmunks. And then you have, you know, this is, these are the reservoirs, remember. <laughs> um, they, they get close to your house. And then, you know, next thing you know, that you just, they're closer to you. So you want to keep them away. Uh, garbage and you know, contained, and then again, reduce plants that attract deer, and then you can get a, um, spraying your property, you can get um, someone that knows what they're doing that are, that are vetted to spray property, um, and they can do organic or the traditional pesticides, which is becoming more and more common. And this is a, a perfect world picture of, you know, um, not having tall grass by the house and having borders, so this is just something to create a tick safe zone, um, you know, just is a helpful visual. And a future vaccine for Lyme disease, um, it, there is uh, um, trials that are, um, that are underway. There was a, a Lyme disease vaccine a number of years ago, but it proved to be ineffective. It didn't have longevity. So um, basically you're looking at uh, blocking the ability of uh, ticks to um, feed, um, with a, with a vaccine, but it will only um, help with Lyme disease, not with the other tick-borne diseases. And the next slide. Uh, and again, the CDC has um, is a great great resource for information. Um, so I recommend between that and the uh, the Lyme Disease Resource Center. And I'm open to questions. Yeah. So thank you everyone for attending this webinar. We're gonna do another post um, survey, post poll. Um, I'm gonna launch it now and it's again an anonymous. And it's just to see if how well we are doing in meeting the learning objectives. So I'm going to, oops, launch the second poll. So if you could just complete this poll as well. We're just gonna give it one more minute so everyone has time to complete the poll. All right, and just to go through the poll answers was that um, based on what you know, know which um, based on what you know a vector is, what is the best answer? That would be tick. Um, why are, select the reason why there are more ticks on Long Island. This could be because there's too many deer. Um, it is false that Lyme's disease is the only tick-borne disease. And some common symptoms of Lyme's disease is the rash, fever, muscle aches, and fatigue. Um, runny nose and a cough aren't common symptoms of Lyme's disease. 
Um, it is also false that if a person gets Lyme's disease, it'll eventually go away on its own. And um, the common strategy to prevent or reduce exposure to ticks and the examples given are wearing a hat. You shouldn't wear short sleeves or shorts when you're going into mm -hmm. um, a tick populated area, like going hiking, you should wear long sleeves and long pants. You shouldn't wear dark colors, lighter colors are better so that you can see the ticks and you should always wear um, close toed shoes. So it's not recommended to wear sandals. Um, and so, yeah, if you have any questions, um, we can now refer to Dr. Wellens to answer these questions. Um, someone asked, what do you mean by aggressive? And I think this is when you were talking about the female ticks. Lone star. Yeah, the lone star tick uh, nymphs, um, the larvae, the nymphs, and the females, the adult females are very aggressive. They're, they will, they're called hunters and they will travel longer distances than the deer, the black-legged deer ticks will. They also can, because I guess they're from the south, uh, they can tolerate le um, less humidity. They don't need to rehydrate as often as the, the black-legged deer ticks are. They're very, very aggressive. They'll, um, and they will, they're called hunters. They will travel further to, to, get, a, to get a meal. Does anyone else have any more questions? Um, some questions that we were wondering is if any of the participants thought there was anything missing from the webinar or was there anything else that you have questions about or would have liked us to discuss? So Dr. Wellens is here to answer any questions mm -hmm. you all have. I, I have a question. So I live on the east end of Long Island and I get my property sprayed with um, uh, you know, the um, ingredients to help mm -hmm. get rid of the, the ticks. And I have an organic um, solution that goes down to help kill the ticks. And you said in your, your presentation mm -hmm. that organic um, pesticides are okay. Yeah, they're, you, they have to be reapplied more frequently and they can also get diluted with rain. Okay. So, um, you know, and if you basically, if you have a really good person who knows what they're doing, they're like, they're vetted, they're supposed to be, you know, that they're, they have a, like a, a vetted firm, a vetted, vetted company. Um, they're very, very knowledgeable and they can discuss, like, depending on like where you are, they, they'll, they'll advise you, but yeah, the organic is good, but you may have to reapply it more often. And, and he does come more often. Okay. All which right. I have questioned and, um, and it smells delicious when he sprays it. It's yeah, they're probably essential oils. Yes. Mm -hmm. And even with the regular pesticide um, use, it does not affect, because it's they spray low to the ground. They're spraying the grass area. Um, they, it doesn't affect pollinators. It doesn't affect bees or hummingbirds or anything else. So it's not like it's killing everything. You know, it's just hopefully just killing the ticks. Great. Thank you. Are there any other questions? I have a question. Um, if you have a, a tick bite that you're concerned about mm -hmm. and you do have um, blood testing done, how many times do you need to have that done um, to be certain that you don't have a tick-borne disease? Is one time enough or should you follow up again? A few months later, if you're having some symptoms, you know, what, what is kind of yeah. the guidance there? Um, for, well, for Lyme is a little bit different than the other tick-borne diseases. The other, um, outside of Lyme, every, you can get an early test for, um, for that disease, so you know what you're dealing with. Uh, Lyme disease, what I recommend is no early testing, no test, because it's a way, it's not going to yield anything. If you get treated early and... Uh, you are feeling well, you don't need a test. If you get treated early and you're still having symptoms, I definitely will get a test a month out. Or if you were treated late for whatever reason, I'll get a test. So, because antibodies don't show up until three to four weeks after exposure. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it really depends on the specifics of, this, of the situation. Okay, thank you for that. You're welcome.
Is this year a particularly bad year, or what do you what do you see? Well, we're kind of. Um, it, it, it's bad out there. There are a lot of ticks and people are getting bit. Um, one of the problems in primary care is that I'm doing a lot more telemedicine and people are a little reluctant to get, you know, because of social distancing and things like that. So, um, but I don't, you know, it, it doesn't seem any different than years prior in terms of the ticks. Um, you know, I th it's just getting worse over, you know, over time. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's, it's more challenging. And if you think about COVID-19 and Lyme disease or any of the tick-borne diseases, like really, there's, I mean, there was a joke going around Corona with Lyme, <laughs> you know, the Corona beer with Lyme. So, um, but yeah, so it's, um, it's, we've been just treating, I've been seeing patients who want telemedicine and just treating them, you know, based on their symptoms. Um, there's a question in the chat um, asking if some people are more susceptible to Lyme disease than others. Um, well, again, the ability to clear it, you, have, particularly, you need the antibiotics because um, although there have been cases of individuals that had showed antibody positive, and there's two types of antibodies. There's IgM, which I, M is now for miserable, and IgG is for gone. And there have been cases of individuals that have had high type G IgG past infection that were never treated. Although, however, if you get treated with an antibiotic for another reason, it may also help Lyme. But um, there, um, there also is some question, some people tend not to get bit by ticks for whatever reason, uh, or, but again, the Lone Star tick will bite anybody. I mean, so that's kind of the Lone Star tick kind of just you know, throws out for a loop there, but um, we all have different immune systems. So, but I, I generally, people cannot clear this. Not like babesiosis in a child where they can clear it. Um, anybody who gets Lyme disease, it's very, very difficult for them. They will not be able to clear it on their own for the most part. I think it's very rare. There's a new question in the chat about um, what is the best way to clean the wound after removing a tick? Uh, alcohol. Okay. Yeah, and you can put a little um, antibiotic cream on there, that's fine. And a lot, like the Lone Star tick bite, that will leave a mark, particularly if you're very fair, um, for a long time. So I have patients that come in, I have all these brown bites, and I said that's, you know, from the tick bite. You have to be, also be careful about putting steroid cream on. You can put a little steroid cream for the itching, but don't slather it on because the steroid cream can discolor skin. Mm -hmm. uh, I have a couple questions. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I'm the one who asked about if pe some people are more susceptible. Oh, maybe about 25, 30 years ago, my husband got Lyme disease and got the classic bullseye ring, was treated with tetracycline at the time. Mm -hmm. And then a couple years later, he got it again. Same classic ring and oh, yeah. again, oh, yeah. each time was treated. So I was wondering if he's more susceptible than, you know, some, maybe another person. Well, it depends he, if he's outside and he's working, you know, if he, I don't know, occupationally, you can be, you're more at risk if you work outside. Like that's why the landscapers and farmers and, and the migrant workers are real, real challenged because they usually are not, don't have healthcare access. Um, but yeah, if you're outside gardening or outside working, you're more at risk and every, and and if you get a rash and symptoms, it means you keep getting exposed, you will keep getting sick and you'll keep needing antibiotics. Okay, so there is no an antibodies that will build up that will prevent you from getting no, it again. No, that's why we're looking for a vaccine. Yeah, no. Okay, and, it, and I guess doxycycline is now the preferred treatment. Doxycycline is preferred. You can also use amoxicillin and there's some other, like I had a patient who was allergic to everything and she had to go on azithromycin. And that's the last, the last but layer. Is, so. is doxycycline more effective than yes. tetracycline? Yeah, yeah. Well, okay. tetracycline is like it, it. Doxy is a derivative. It's from um, actually, I think doxycycline may have been discovered at Stony Brook, believe it or not, back in the day. But yeah. um, it's uh, it's it's another a newer generation from the tetracycline. 
same family, but it's a, a newer generation drug. Very effective. Thank you. All right, we're a little bit over time. So um, if anyone has a few more questions now, please ask them otherwise. Um, this will be the end of the webinar. And we would just like to thank Dr. Wellens again. Thank you so much for presenting all this information. Okay, and if also you can reach the TIC Center, it's 631-726-TIC, uh, and you could talk to the nurse who's, who's very savvy on tick-borne diseases. Thank you, Dr. Wellen. Thank you, Gabriella, and everyone who participated today. Thanks for having me. All right. Thank you. Okay. Bye. Bye.